Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding Love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Has the way that love has arisen in you seemed out of place or even taboo? My mission is to expand the conversation of love in the world. Is it possible to have deep, loving, healthy relationships? Have you ever been curious about having more than one relationship or partner at a time? Get ready to transform in love. Be courageous and set yourself free. In this show, we talk about relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. I- All right. Welcome to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love. And today we are talking about how sexy consent is. But before we get into that and introduce our phenomenal guest, a reminder that the Elizabeth Cunningham Show is live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page and is then aired on YouTube and podcast every Thursday. And all links that you need to keep up with us are in the show notes. Okay, great. So on today's episode, we will be talking with Dr. Sean Miller about how sexy consent is. And Sean Miller received his PhD in philosophy. He focuses on the philosophy of sex, love, sex education, and relationships. He has written articles on sexual consent, masculinity, and BDSM. Currently, he teaches at Salt Lake Community College. Hi, Sean. How's it going? I'm great. How are you? Ah, I am so good. I am so excited to have this conversation because it I I mean I feel like I say this every single week I think all of these conversations are super important Mm -hmm. um but I think consent is foundational um to sex and relationships and doing those things with integrity as you're about to share with us and get into more today. So I'm I'm really excited to to have this conversation. Great. Yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Ah, beautiful. So what I love to do on this show is to really lay the groundwork so that we're all on the same page and that we know what we're talking about. Um, so can you say a little bit more about what you mean by consent? Hmm. There is such a big philosophical and enriching history behind that. Mm. I would say that at minimum, consent has always been seen as uh, a voluntary informed agreement. And that has been sort of the baseline since Mm. philosophers and sex educators have been thinking about sexual consent. Mm -hmm. And over time, that view has been critiqued and then probably around the late 80s and 90s, another form of consent developed, which was more of an ideal standard where you had to achieve the highest ideals and you had to achieve enthusiasm. Sometimes enthusiasm consent is part of this whole process. But lately, that has also been scrutinized as well. And I'm part of that discussion where that ideal standard has been scrutinized and criticized a little bit and I think in order to look at consent it's got to be rethought instead of looking at consent as a contract based model it should be based more on negotiations and communications so at the forefront I see consent as more of a skill rather than making some sort of an agreement with the other person And these skills have to be developed over time and they have to be practiced in order for you to understand what consent is. And part of that skill is kind of remaking and reforming your agency. Okay. I I really like that because I, I I mean, my training involves the model of enthusiastic consent Um, and so I'm familiar with that model of like enthusiastic consent, like that's consent, um, or ongoing 
consent is like is also uh, how I was trained as well and it sounds like um uh, you know what you're talking about is more inside of that ongoing consent and like an ongoing conversation rather than like a one-time yes or no yeah so I I like the term ongoing consent mm -hmm. as long as that consent is not thought of as um, some sort of contractual agreement we often think of consent as uh, we agree to do this and then sometime later we're still agreeing and sometime later we're still agreeing as if it's uh, an ongoing contract. Mm. The ongoing consent I like is where there's consent involved with, with the other person, but you're more in tune with the other person. And being in tune means um, part of it could be checking in if you want to be more explicit uh, but definitely communication is going to be part of that foundation. It could be explicit communication, but it also has to kind of read body language as part of that skill. And I think reading body language is a skill and that is going to be part of the process of undergoing consent. Yeah. And, you know, I'm interested in, cause you, you've brought it up in more of a skill set, and I really love that. And I want to, I want to ask more questions about like, what is the skill set of consent? And before we do that in laying the groundwork is um, what do you mean by sex? Because we're talking specifically about, because you can have consent in a lot of different areas of your life, but in this conversation specifically, we're more focused on sex. So what do you mean by sex? <laughs> that is the major million dollar question <laughs> the major million dollar question I love this is one of my favorite questions I'm like ooh, what are you gonna say <laughs> yeah <laughs> um I mean I the typical answer has always been some sort of sexual intercourse but that's such a very narrow definition right um <clears throat> I think and obviously this is probably going to be asking well what do you mean by that but it is. <laughs> it's, I, it's a fractal. It's ever expanding. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. I, I think a good way to define sex is some sort of fulfillment of sexual desire such that you can achieve some sort of sexual pleasure. I know that's very broad. Super but, broad. Yeah. But but I like that though. Yeah. I do too, because it captures a lot and the boundaries are fuzzy. But I, I kind of like that because sometimes you want fuzzy boundaries when you're making these broad definitions. Yeah, and um, and I'm <laughs> I'm a little hesitant to ask this question because it's a little bit more like just for my own curiosity and not like fully on board. Um, but it, like I uh, I generally think of sex as like whatever we agree that sex is like at the time right? We're like, is, is this sex? Yes or no, you know? And like, maybe, you know, I don't know, but it's like, whatever, whatever the, the parties who are involved agree to is like, that's sex. Yeah, I can see that too. And I think in many ways, um, both of our viewpoints, both of our insights match up where if they agree that this is sex, it's probably because it has some sort of sexual desire that matches our sexual pleasures with it. So yeah, I think it fits well with both of our ideas. Nice. All right. Agreed. If we <laughs> okay. were if we were in person, I would high five you. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so that's kind of broadly what we're talking about, like the broader definition of consent, the broader definition of sex. Um, and so at, and you're you're talking about consent as a skill set. Um, but I guess I want to ask that question in a little bit of a different way, which is what are some different forms of consent? Like what does it actually look like? So different forms of consent. Um well, in the past, a lot of people defined consent as, I think I mentioned before, this, this minimal standard where you just had to make sure that everyone involved was agreeing on whatever was happening and that they were informed and that there was no coercion. Mm -hmm. That's the minimal baseline. Um, and then another form of consent um, is this very highly ideal situation where 
it kind of changes what consent looks like because this ideal standard, it's no longer focusing on agreements, rather it's focusing on the desires of the participants. Because with this highly ideal standard, the ideal is that everyone is at this highest desire possible. And whenever they're trying to reach that highest ideal, it's typically related to what, what they want out of it. And that want transforms the agreement to desire. So that's the second form. Another form that is taking a look at consent as more of a communication-based model. And this is being influenced with a lot of philosophers today where they see communication as the baseline. And this communication sees consent not so much as certain uh, requests, but coming from another philosopher, their name is Kuo Kokla, saying that these consent forms, these communication forms are more like invitations and gift offers. And that framework tells us that maybe any sort of sexual initiations, sexual communication, sexual negotiations, they're not like the paradigm example of consent where with consent you're making agreements and making requests. Mm -hmm. Instead, consent or any sort of sexual initiation should be seen more like an invitation, should be seen more like a gift offer. Mm -hmm. And these invitations and gift offers seem more in line and more in tune with how we actually engage with sex. Um, we don't accept or refuse sexual requests, except for extreme circumstances. We accept invitations to sex or refuse invitations. We accept or refuse gift offers. And that seems to be more in tune and more like how we experience uh, sexuality rather than simply taking a request or not. No, I really love that because um, that is that is more in line with how we naturally interact with one another rather because one of the conversations that I have with people around consent and what I do is like they're like well I do I have to explicitly say everything do we need to like write everything down like what like what does that even mean and so what you're talking about does seem to line up with more of that natural expression of what we're already doing but just doing it in a safe and more conscious manner mm -hmm. exactly yeah yeah beautiful yeah. Well, we're going to go on a really quick break. Um, and I, I mean, I love the philosophical and like the, the, like the definitions of things, but when we come back, I really want to get into like, how does this play out? Like, why is this, you know, why is this topic and these conversations so important in our actual lives? Right. And what we're dealing with. So that's what we're going to talk about when we come back. Sounds great. <laughs> Welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love. And today we're talking to Dr. Sean Miller about how sexy consent is. And before our break, we uh, laid the foundations of what are we talking about when we're talking about consent? And I'm so happy that I asked that question because there have been so many iterations of consent and I never thought about it in that like succinct of a way before. And like, I feel like in kind of spreading out that history of it, that it's like, oh yeah, that's why I've had this one notion of consent versus like the things that are coming out now and like what I'm learning now as well. And then also like, what do we mean by sex? Because I think that everyone thinks that they know what they mean by sex. And so therefore other people have the same definition that they do. But I've asked hundreds of people, what do you mean by sex? And I've never gotten like the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so really having that, having that explicit conversation is, is really great as well. Um, but I really want to talk about, you know, how does this apply to, you know, our everyday lives? You know, why is this an important thing to talk about just on, an, on a regular basis? I think it's important just because the whole idea of consent has been on the forefront of everyone's minds for uh, the last 10, 20 years. 
Um, I think it's been more on the forefront since the Me Too movement. And everyone has now been thinking, well, what do you mean by consent? What is consent all about? On my view, consent and autonomy just go well together. They go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And with autonomy, the more autonomous you are, the more that you can consent to some activity. Uh, because if you can't consent, that means you are either being misinformed, you're being lied to, you're being coerced. And that relates also to someone is undermining your autonomy. And autonomy doesn't have to be something outside of yourself. Uh, being non-autonomous, it can also work against you on the inside. So if you don't have certain skills, as I mentioned before, if you don't have uh, the proper ways of looking at the world in a correct way, well, then you're not going to be autonomous. The way to lift your autonomy is building up these practices, building up these skills, and that in turn will help you become more in tune with exactly what you're consenting to and better at negotiation and communicating all those other facets that comes with sex. Yeah, well, and I'm curious, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm curious what these skills are that you're, in, that you're talking about. Like, what are the skills that you need to have autonomy and agency and be able to consent fully? Yeah, so broadly, these skills are ways that helps build your character. Um, just as a very quick example, um, if someone is and this is a non-sexual example, if someone is constantly afraid all the time of anything and everything, then their autonomy is gonna be very limited because they really can't act and really can't do things that they wanna do. So they have to build up the characteristic of, of courage and that way it kind of breaks them out of their fearful state and they can actually do more things. In the sexual realm, certain sexual skills that helps build one agency our communication skills, um, the ability to say or receive a no, uh, the, the courage to say no, uh, other facets such as um, being aware and being competent of understanding what's happening. I think of these skills, not just as a gentle skills, but uh, competency skills. Um, these other characteristics is, are ways to build your sexual character such that instead of having a very limited view or limited range of what your sexual character can do, it'll kind of lift yourself up such that your ability to think ahead, your ability to look at what sort of being you could be is now part of your thinking. It's now part of your character. I think it's a skill that we really don't build on or people even think about because Whenever we think about sexuality, I think often people just think about, well, I have these desires and I want to fulfill those desires just to get the pleasure. And that's fine. That's typically how we think about it. But if we want a more robust view of how to build a sexual character and build that sexual autonomy, then these certain skills have to be, what is it that I really want? Do I want this because I really want it? Or do I want it because that's sort of this expectation of me? Mm -hmm. Do I pursue this because this is something that those desires are kind of peeking out of me? And are those desires really mine? And why should I fulfill those desires? Those are just some examples. Um, these other skills could be uh, receiving a no diligently. Often whenever we hear a no, uh, we take it personally. And I think especially with sex and intimacy, uh, we really take it to heart where we feel rejected. Right, like personal, personally attacked. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think one skill we could learn is that hearing a no doesn't have to be a personal attack. Mm -hmm. It's just, this is someone who at that moment perhaps does not want to engage in that activity, maybe yeah. sometime later, but uh, that's just something that you have to honorably accept yeah they're saying no to sex not no to you as a human being exactly yeah yeah um 
So those are just some of the examples here. And I, I did purposely make it broad because I, I did want to say that, you know, there's more skills that we can think about. And I know that there's sex educators and that there's other people who really focus on the psychology of character who can really delve into a, a deep analysis of, oh, here's one particular skill that people could really work on and yeah. trying to lift that up into building a better autonomous individual. Yeah, because one of the things that I was thinking while you were sharing that is, yeah, what are the barriers that people have in building these skills? Because there's the skill of, you know, knowing what you want, which is absolutely a skill for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's a skill of knowing what you want. But what I run into is like the and, you know, you were kind of pointing to this with like the more like the psychological analysis of the blocks and the barriers that people run into and like, okay, even if you do know what you want, you do know that you, what you desire that, you know, thought of like, I can't have that, or I have a lot of shame around that, or am I wrong for wanting that, mm -hmm. you know, or if I ask for that, it, would that be too much? Would that, you know, would I, or am I going to get rejected? right and then having that like when they're going to reject me not like what I you know in rejecting what I want then therefore they are rejecting me exactly yeah um especially with any sort of activities or intimacies that are usually considered on the fringe they're usually not quote-unquote normal and so if someone has this desire that is um not typical then they might feel shame or they might feel hesitant to express that desire. And so how do they manage that? How do they do with that? And I think having the skill of working through either the shame or working through ways to either communicate or fulfill that desire is another way of gaining that competency skill. Yeah. And and I'm also thinking about the impact of not having these skills. And I think that the, you know, the main one that we think of is like sexual assault, you know, mm -hmm. which is like, oh, well, if you're not asking for consent, then, and you're going, you're moving forward. Now you're moving into the realm of sexual assault. Um, but there's also, you know, what are the other impacts of not having these skills? I mean, there's other impacts besides just, okay, now you're assaulting someone. Yeah, I think with sexual assault, there's two, two ways to look at the, the way that these competency skills can be helpful. Um, one is when it comes to any sort of assault, sometimes you have people who are kind of at that blurry line where it's not really assault, but it is very manipulative and it's heading towards unjust sexual activity and people on 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 all throughout society they learn that sexual assault is bad and they have this picture of what sexual assault looks like but when you have something that's on the fringe where it's just really harsh um, manipulation and negative persuasion then people might think oh this isn't really assault but they still don't feel good about it. They still don't feel comfortable about it. Mm -hmm. So one competency skill could be recognizing, also listening to their body saying, well, this is something that I'm still not for. And even though it's not in that black and white area of assault, it's still mm -hmm. not a good realm to be in. And so I think those competencies, one of those competency skills is to just recognize that this is deep manipulation and they were not, they're not going to stand for it. Um, but the other is um, the, the framework of how manipulation works. I mean, it is very gendered. Uh, most men are more of the manipulators and most women are receiving the manipulation. And so the second part of that is uh, a huge structural framework where everything has to change so that the sexes are equal, which is <laughs> quite the task itself. But at the same time, it's going to help men these competency skills because some men don't even realize what they're doing is manipulative they don't even recognize what they're doing is negative persuasion they think this is just the normal way that you initiate sex and 
once you help them know this is something that's not appropriate just because of the power dynamics, then hopefully they can understand, okay, so I have to have this skill that what I'm doing isn't correct. And I'm going to pull back and make sure that there's enough room, there's enough autonomy for her to express what she wants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I often find that as well when I'm talking to people who've been in situations where the lines have been blurrier, where, and it is typically the, the man, the someone who identifies as, as a man that I'm talking to, who is like, I just didn't even realize that. I just mm-hmm. didn't even know that. Um, and so I think that, yeah, one of the main, not, not main, well, how do I want to say that? One of the reasons why this conversation is so important is just to talk about it is just so that the information is out there because one of the things is that, yeah, like sometimes you just have these conversations. They're like, oh, I didn't even know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that's the trickier part of, Mm -hmm. of helping men like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are going to take another break. Um, and when we get back, we will dive a little bit deeper into what is possible when you do have these beautiful consent conversations, when you do have the skills, the skills of consent, then what is possible? So we're going to get into that when we get back. Sounds great. Welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham Show, Courageously Expanding in Love, and we are here with Dr. Sean Miller talking about how sexy consent is. And we've talked about what consent is, what sex is, different iterations of consent over the years, um, and and what happens when we we don't have consent in relationships or the pitfalls or the things that can go wrong and like not not taking on um, consent. Um, and so I would love to turn the conversation to what is possible. Like if people learn, if really if people really took on learning the skills of consent, what would be possible? It's, it's going to be a daunting project, yeah. but <laughs> I think the, the first thing is to have a, a well-robust sex education. Uh, sex education um, right now focuses, especially in the United States, on abstinence, and that's just a miserable form of education. But there's also some really good advanced ones. Um, there's a consent-based form of sex education, which is definitely better. Um, but with consent-based, um, because they're trying to uh, appeal to uh, the school board and parents and trying to teach 30 plus students, um, in order to see the program being successful, they focus on the outcomes of whether their their teaching worked. And so they look at did your actions change? Did your behavior change? And that's that's great because that's what consent is. It's trying to change people's actions and behaviors. Um, but I think there's something even more foundational than consent, and that is the sexual character. And that's really hard. Uh, how do you change sexual character? How do you help people with their sexual character? And I think that's a form of sex education that should really be taught, um, but it's really hard to implement because sexual character is something that it's not going to be an overnight thing. I kind of think of changing your character um, very similar to like being an athlete or being a musician. Uh, You're not going to change your mind or change your body overnight. It's going to be a progression and you just have to kind of stick with it so that those new slow characters develop until it becomes you, until it becomes part of your second nature. And so the example is that men may not realize that they are being manipulative. They didn't even realize that. Well, I think a good way to do that, if you're in a sex education class, is to help, well, the teacher is supposed to be really helpful with this, but the teacher is supposed to be helpful of um, getting the men to understand that what they're actually doing is just part of this traditional gender and sexual script that you've learned throughout your lives. But what if what you've learned was actually the wrong or incorrect way? Maybe here's another way. And then hopefully the men will take that in and kind of discard that aspect of who they are 
and start to implement that new characteristic. Now, outside of sex education, because I think that's gonna be a, a long project, I think there's some really good communities that can be helpful in trying to learn these new sexual characteristics. And these are gonna to be tough to find because you have to kind of dig down and find them. I know there's really good um, pockets on Instagram. There's some really good meetups where they really focus on sexual consent and sexual character. And I think it's those where you start to be part of that community that you can kind of build your sexual character. Lots of research shows that if you're in a community, then you will start to pick up those characteristics in that community. You'll start to pick up those habits. And so if you want to be in a more, you want to be more sex positive, for example, be in a sex positive community and those sex positive characteristics will kind of rub off on you. If you want to be in a, in a in a way where you're more in tune more aware of your sexuality which is similar to being sex positive then you have to be in a community that has people where they're more in tune and more aware of their of their sexuality so that would be a good start is a really robust sex education but short of that you have to find a community that has those certain values so that those values will start to be implemented into you and then you will start to form those characteristics because of that community. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a, more of a proactive approach mm -hmm. for sure, because sex education in, especially in the United States is probably not going to change in the uh, near future and which is very unfortunate mm -hmm. um even though steps are being taken in that direction but as everyone knows there's been a lot of um regression in that area in just this these past recent months um so there's all there is there's a lot of work to do in that area and for anybody who wants to take you know, take the charge on that, join the movement, um, as it were, but it is, I mean, what I'm hearing you say is, you know, that if you want to have, uh, better, um, characteristics and be someone who is more conscious about consent, that it absolutely is a proactive conscious thing that you have to do and seek out it is not going to fall in your lap and you got the education that you got your past is your past and nobody's going to go back and change that and so it is like up to the individual to make that decision for themselves and what I'm also hearing and what you're saying is that you know for those people who might feel stuck or resistant to doing that. I think one of the other themes of our conversation has been to not take it personally. You know, like this is not like a defamation of your character to admit that you have things about yourself that maybe don't work or don't work as well as you'd like them to. Um, and to really be able to not take that personally and to just look at what is what's actually going to what do I actually want what do I need to do to get there and shedding your ego a little bit is mm -hmm. what I'm <laughs> that's what I'm picking up from what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> yes a lot of that is definitely true I mm -hmm. think I really liked um, how you emphasize that you know don't be harsh on yourself uh, it's a step-by-step -step process where um, sometimes you will mess up and that's fine. That's part of the learning process. Uh, whenever people do a completely new sexual activity, um, sometimes people will mess up. And instead of just kind of being um, agitated or frustrated about it, um, it's best to just kind of laugh about it and see yourself as, okay, well, it didn't work this time. I'm going <laughs> to try it again next time. Um, that's, now that's activities. Now do it with your character. Uh, that's even tougher where oh, I really wanted to have a skill. The skill isn't sticking with me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep on going with it. And hopefully it'll just kind of come to me by second nature. Um, the examples I gave before, like being an athlete or being a musician, 
Uh, if you talk to major athletes and major musicians, they messed up a lot when they started, but they got better at it. And I think the same thing can be done with your sexual character, where instead of being passive, you are definitely being proactive. You have to work on yourself in the same way as an athlete or a musician works on themselves to be better. I think the same way is that you have to work on yourself to be a better sexual character. Oh, I love that. I I absolutely love that so much. And I love the analogy to like the musician and athlete. I think that makes it really tangible. And I just wanted to share like a really quick, funny story about like laughing at yourself, mm -hmm. like when you mess up, just being like, all right, like I'm human. Um, so I, uh, um, every once in a while, I go to um, this uh, rope jam in Seattle. And for those of you who don't know what that is, basically it's a meetup with people who want to be tied up um, uh, in shibari uh, style ropes um, and people who know how to do that and want to practice or are learning how to do that and want to practice. And so I really like being tied up. I go, there's this guy um, that I connected with last time and he was like tying me up and he's like, really like he go, he travels all over the world doing like shows and stuff like that. Like he's really good at his craft. Right. And so he's like tying me up and he's like talking to me about it and like all this stuff. And then he was like, yeah, he's like, sometimes he's like what I, I don't even remember the question that I asked him, but he was like, yeah, he's like every once in a while I mess up. He's like, but I learned a long time ago that if you're performing and you're tying someone up and you mess up, that you should just say, ta-da, <laughs> and, <laughs> and just keep rolling with it. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and, I, and so it, and it's, it's the same thing where it's just, it's not giving yourself such a, you know, hard time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you're like in a sexual situation where it's just like something happened that it didn't, you didn't mean to go that way. Like, um, you know, if it's appropriate to like, yeah, you can make light of it. You can laugh. You can be like, oh my gosh, silly me. Ta-da. Like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to take another break and then we will be right back. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to the Elizabeth Cunningham show, courageously expanding in love. And we are here having, I, this is such a great conversation with Dr. Sean Miller. Um, Sean, again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing so much of your, your wisdom and your work and your expertise around consent and sex. This has been, I I've learned some things. It was a pleasure to have this conversation with you. And I really hope that a lot of people gained a lot of information from this. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you some of my end of show questions and we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what does love mean to you? Oh, uh, I think it is having some deep care and concern in a very robust way to towards someone or mm. something. I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. If people got nothing else, what do you hope they got out of this episode? I hope that the main thing they got is that your sexuality and your sexual character does not have to be on autopilot, but it is a proactive thing where you can work on yourself and building yourself in a way where it's sort of like an upgrade of your sexual character. Oh my gosh, I love that. I hope they got that too. <laughs> What's an action that people can take out of listening today? I think one action is start small. Find one characteristic that you want to work on. Either a characteristic that you don't have or a negative characteristic that you don't like and try to work on that characteristic. And much like riding a bike, you're gonna struggle at first, but keep at it, keep practicing, and eventually you'll get better at it. Mm, thank you. All right, what are you promoting? How can people find you? 
Um, there's a couple of ways. One is um, I have a website. It's seanmiller.blog. And there it's mostly my academic information, um, but I also have a, a blog portion on there. So you can read about the various thoughts that I'm having throughout my whole academic career there. I um, love it. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, and I'm a bit more um, proactive on this one, is through Instagram. Uh, my handle there is a coffee and research. And just like it says, it's both coffee that I either make or go to coffee shops and research and i'm just looking at something that i'm researching at that moment whether it's a philosophy book or an article or just something that really inspires me to think really deeply about i mm. actually i love your instagram page oh thank you yeah i'm also a huge fan of coffee and research i was like and i didn't realize because i was like oh like i'll learn a lot from like the research and you know all of those things i was i was excited about that and i was like oh yeah coffee's cool but you posted about coffee the other day and i actually like got really excited about it i was like <laughs> oh my god i was like i've had that <laughs> oh, that's awesome <laughs> So, but for just to be tr transparent about like when I started following you, because I was just like, I was like, oh yeah, whatever coffee, da, 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 da. like I'm more interested in like your thoughts on like these topics and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the other day I got really excited about one of your coffee. Pots. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I surprised myself. <laughs> I surprised a lot of people with that too. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, uh, and all of those for everyone who's listening, um, those links are all in the show notes. Actually, I think I need to put the, um, I think I need to put your blog in the show notes. I think I only have your Instagram. So I'll make sure I'll do that after this, after we chat today. Oh, good. Perfect. Um, but yeah, so all of those links are, or will be <laughs> in the show notes. Um, and Sean, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. It was great to have this pleasurable conversation with you. <laughs> All right. And thank you every single person who has been listening today, who is listening right now in the future whatever space and time that you are listening to this episode. Thank you so much. And if this was something that you found to be really helpful, then please share it. Um, share it on your social media, share it with a friend, share it with a partner. Um, this has been such an invaluable conversation that we've had today that I think more people need to be conscious of, um, even if, you know, everyone has heard the buzzword consent, but have you thought about it in this way? So definitely please share if this was something that was also invaluable to you. And then remember to subscribe, to turn on notifications so you don't miss anything. We are live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. on the Transformation Network Facebook page. And then the show is aired on YouTube and podcast platforms every Thursday. And all links for that are in the show notes. All right, y'all. Until next time, keep loving. You have been listening to The Elizabeth Cunningham Show, courageously expanding love with me, Elizabeth Cunningham. Tune in live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on TransformationTalkRadio.com, where we shed light on relationships, sex, love, and the ways we wish we could be, but never thought were possible. Learn to love yourself and create the relationships you want. Connect with me at ElizabethAnnCunningham.com. That's ElizabethAnnCunningham.com. 